It is the law of history that the simpler the people's will, the more complex the job of politicians. This is undoubtedly because politics is not what it pretends to be, the expression of a collective will. Politics breathes well only where this will is multiple, hesitant, confused, and obscure. Yeah, Foucault was actually in Iran. His interest in Iran was due to his fascination at the time with the idea of being a philosopher journalist. He went to all the French newspapers to do this, but they rejected him. So he settled on the Italian daily Corriere della Serra to write and edit a regular feature loosely called Michel Foucault Investigates. The original plan was for him to write a series on President Carter's America. However, with his newly acquired awareness of the growing political tensions in Iran, Foucault visited Tehran instead. He arrived on September the 10th, 1978, two days after the capital had been stopped by a week of demonstrations. The first and second demonstrations had been peaceful, and drew unprecedented numbers. According to some estimates, more than one million people participated in the first, and hundreds of thousands more in the second. The third demonstration, immediately after which Foucault arrived in Tehran, known in the history of the Iranian Revolution as Black Friday, marked a turning point in the revolutionary moment. 88 people were massacred mostly by heavy machine gun shots fired from military helicopters. Foucault revealed his awe in an interview that was published in March 1979, one month after the collapse of the monarchy. When I arrived in Iran, I said to myself that I was going to find a terrorized city because there had been 4,000 dead. Now, while I can't say that I found happy people, there was an absence of fear and an intensity of courage. Among the things that characterize this revolutionary event, there is the fact that it brought out an absolutely collective will on the streets. Foucault describes how in Tehran he witnessed a concrete manifestation of an old abstract concept in French political philosophy. The notion of collective will. In the Iranian revolution, he saw an instance of an anti-teleological view of history. What the hell is a teleological view of history? So teleology is a form of historical inquiry which attempts to construct a narrative that sees history as a progressive march in one direction towards an inevitable endpoint. In contrast to this, Foucault understood the marching masses on the streets of Tehran as the embodiment of what he called political spirituality, making history through the transformation of the self. He prioritized the act and experience of rebellion over the concerns about the outcome of the revolutionary movement itself. You can see this view reflected in his debates with Chomsky. Foucault defined history as a way of reinventing the present moment. This, he believed, was the distinct strength of the revolution. What attracted him to the revolution was the ambiguity within which it operated. Not ambiguity in its rejection of the Shah, but in its vision of the future, in the lack of an affirmative and precise description of its agenda. This is why the Iranian revolution was seen to be so different to that of the Western definition of revolution. That is to say, he would be opposed to any presentation of a present firmly rooted in a past orientation and a future projection. 
Foucault turned his reports on the Iranian Revolution into a philosophical commentary on modernity. Foucault situated the revolution not in any form of a failed project of modernity, but rather as evidence that it is possible to transcend modernity and the spiritless world within it. He writes that he had been incessantly advised that Iran was going through a crisis of modernization and that a traditional society cannot and does not want to follow its arrogant monarch in his attempt to compete with the industrialized nations. The revolutionary events did not signify a shrinking back in the face of modernization by extremely retrograde elements, to which some commentators refer to as archaic fascism. But he argued that the Shah was hopelessly trying to preserve a modernization project envisioned in the 1920s by his father to fashion the country into a European state. He ridiculed the liberal nationalist ideas that Iran needed a modified modernization under a constitutional regime with the motto, let the king reign, but not govern. For him, archaic was modernization itself not the religious mode of the revolutionary expression. Foucault believed that the revolutionary movement in Iran with its struggle to present a different way of thinking about society and politics was to offer the West the possibility of an exit from its own intellectual exhaustion. We have to abandon, he conveys to an Iranian writer, every dogmatic principle and question one by one the validity of all principles that have been the source of oppression. We have to construct another political thought, another political imagination and teach anew the vision of a future. By emphasizing the significance of ideas and how they give rise to collective movements of revolutionary proportion, Foucault situated himself in opposition to both postmodern incredulity towards all that is grand, as well as to Marxist dogma. He wrote, Some say that the great ideologies are in the course of dying. The contemporary world, however, is burgeoning with ideas. One has to be present at the birth of ideas and at the explosion of their force, not in the books that pronounce them, but in the vent in which they manifest their force, and in the struggles people wage for or against ideas. Contrary to a commonplace reading of Foucault's enthusiasm about the Iranian revolution, in his view, religion does not appear as an incidental element of the movement. Rather, it links the revolutionary movement directly to the people's general sense of their place in the world. So what is the role of religion, Foucault asked. Not that of an ideology, which would help mask contradictions or form a sort of sacred union between divergent interests. Religion afforded the revolution a vocabulary. Foucault's enthusiasm about revolutionary politics in Iran was also informed by a debate within French intellectual circles kindled by revisionist accounts of the French Revolution's place in history. Such revisionist interventions struck a chord with the defeatist French left and triumphant liberals, those who wanted, in Zizek's words, a decaffeinated revolution, or a revolution which does not smell of a revolution. <laughs> not only did Foucault try to make sense of revolutionary spirituality, he also admired the fact that the Iranian masses revived the spirit of revolution which many Europeans believed had disappeared from history. By locating the spirit of the revolution in Iran, Foucault inverted another central element of Orientalism, that of the unchanging essence of Muslim societies. Instead, he laments the stagnation of Western subjectivity and the dominant scepticism about revolutionary political spirituality. Whatever the economic difficulties, we still have to explain why there were people who rose up and said, we're not having any more of this. In rising up, the Iranians said to themselves, and this is perhaps the soul of the uprising, of course we have to change this regime and get rid of this man. 
We have to change this corrupt administration. We have to change the whole country. The political organization, the economic system, the foreign policy, but above all, we have to change ourselves. Even his friends ridiculed Foucault. One of them, Claude Maurice, who had been influenced by Foucault and Deleuze in the early 1970s, recalled a private conversation between them in which he had expressed reservations to Foucault about his support of a political spirituality. But wait, isn't that kind of strange for someone like Foucault to cheer on a revolution whose objective was the establishment of an Islamic state? Uh, his very last piece on the subject, Is it useless to revolt? tries to answer this question. If society persists, and survives. That is to say, if power in these societies is not absolutely absolute, it is because behind all the consent and the coercion, beyond the threats and the violence and the persuasion, there is the possibility of this moment where life cannot be exchanged, where power becomes powerless, and where in front of the gallows and the machine guns, men rise up. So, in a way, he defended his enthusiasm without endorsing its outcome. To Foucault, this very act and experience of becoming, regardless of its actual consequences, needed to be celebrated. But isn't it easy for someone like Foucault to make this judgement? It's not him that's going to be standing up in front of the machine guns. Sure, but for him and for Deleuze, it's wrong to conflate the outcome of a revolutionary movement with this experience. The way revolutions turn out historically and people's revolutionary becoming, these relate to two different sets of people. Men's only hope lies in a revolutionary becoming, the only way of casting off their shame or responding to what is intolerable. The colonization of the uprising by real politic, Foucault argued, does not justify the condemnation of the revolutionary movement. What is more important from the point of view of the subject is not the level of success or failure of the revolutionary movement, but in the manner in which it was lived. <laughs>